It is 1945. World War II is ongoing, but finally winding down. Germany is on the brink of surrender. Italy long has already. But Japan fights on. The ship you are on is making her way through the war-torn Pacific Ocean. But she has been guaranteed safe passage, and she carefully has made her way around a minefield. She is massive, was built for luxury, and has survived direct attack from torpedoes before. Rumored to be inside her hull, a priceless cargo of gold and precious metals. It is a Japanese ship you are on, but due to an agreement with the United States, the ship is guaranteed safe passage, and the U.S. knows what her route is. She sails with her lights on, and the ship is making regular check-ins on the radio and announcing her position so everyone knows she is a vessel not to be sunk. All is well. But then... Due to a case of mistaken identity on the part of an overeager submarine captain, you have been attacked, and you are trapped below. All around you, the ship creaks and cracks as water floods the halls. Soon, the lights slowly begin to dim and burn out, and you are left trapped inside, deep within the vessel, in utter darkness, and it sinks out from underneath you. Out of the 2,000 people on board the ship with you, one will survive. The ship is the Awamaru, and this is the story of her horrific sinking. History is full of horrifying ship disasters. The Titanic, Lusitania, Arctic, Lord Spencer, the White Ship. But this is up there with the very worst, and most terrifying. Fog, overeagerness, fatal human errors will all contribute to one of the most needless losses of life in the Second World War. The Awamaru was laid down in 1941 and launched the next year and completed the year after that. She was in service from 1943 to 1945. She was 502 feet long, had a beam of 66 feet, and weighed 11,249 gross registered tons. During World War II, the Imperial Japanese Navy requisitioned this luxury passenger liner for war service. She made multiple runs to Singapore throughout the war, carrying ammunition and supplies, as well as making trips carrying troops to Burma throughout 1943 and 1944. Awamaru was also part of the Hai-71 convoy and carried Japanese reinforcements to the Philippines during the war. She also made trips into the South China Sea. In August of 1944, Awamaru was actually part of a convoy that was attacked by the USS Rasher, Bluefish, and Spadefish. She was one of several ships torpedoed that night, but she was able to make a successful run to shallow water and beached herself there and was prevented from sinking. She was repaired in Singapore later and returned to Japan the next year. In January 1945, the Japanese and United States governments made an agreement with one another. Despite still being at war, they agreed to allow the safe passage of various ships with the task of carrying Red Cross and other relief supplies to American and other allied POWs being held by the Japanese. Awamaru was one such ship. She was then painted green with large white crosses on each side of her hull, and other ships with this task also had their sailing schedule sent to all submarines with orders that they were to be left alone. This message was broadcast three times, three nights in a row. At night, the ship would sail with all running lights on and with special spotlights on and aimed at her crosses. It is now March 28, 1945. Awamaru was docked in Singapore having delivered vital Red Cross supplies for Allied POWs, and she is now taking on hundreds of stranded merchant marine officers, military personnel, diplomats, as well as a likely cargo of nickel, rubber, lead, tin, and sugar and possibly a few priceless items as well. According to some sources, military contraband was also smuggled aboard by Japanese troops in secret, and some evidence of this would soon be floating on the ocean surface. Now, on March 28th, Awamaru is departing Singapore with cargo and her passengers. Knowing she has been guaranteed safe passage by the United States, she makes way and is due to arrive at her destination on April 4th. There are 2,071 people on board. For a few days, all is well. The ship is left alone as ordered, and she sends a radio message at noon on April 1st, announcing her position. This is the last message that would ever come from the ship.
The USS Queenfish was a Baleo class submarine, her namesake coming from the same fish found off the Pacific coast of North America. She was laid down in Maine in 1943 and launched in November of that year. She was able to achieve a speed of 20.25 knots on the surface and 8.75 when submerged. She could dive to 400 feet, was 311 feet long, and had a beam of 27 feet. Her patrols began in August of 1944, and during this patrol, she sunk the tanker Chiyota Maru north of the Philippines at 21 degrees, 21 minutes north, 121 degrees, 6 minutes east. Throughout her patrols over the next eight months, she would sink six more Japanese ships, including the aircraft escort carrier Akitsu Maru in November 1944. The other vessels she sank included the passenger and cargo vessel Toyoko Maru, the transport ship Manchu Maru, the cargo vessels Keijo Maru and Hako Maru, and the ex-gunboat Cho Jetson Maru. Then that brings us to April 1945. She is on patrol in the Pacific Ocean, and the submarine spots what they believe to be a destroyer making her way through the fog. Commander of the Queen's Fish, Charles E. Lachlan, first spotted the ship on radar at 17,000 yards. Awamaru is sailing at 17 knots, and her visibility is down to 200 yards. Awamaru is not blowing her horn, one of the signs that she was not to be torpedoed or attacked under the International Treaty. And due to her heavily loaded cargo hold, Awamaru is low in the water and appears smaller than she really is on radar. Lachlan slows his ship down to four knots and swings her around to take a shot at the unknown ship. Moving into a distance of 1,200 yards using radar range and bearing, he orders four torpedoes to be fired. He has not actually seen the ship he is shooting at. All four torpedoes strike the Awamaru. She sank in two minutes. Awamaru goes down in 200 feet of water and crashes to the ocean floor. Four gaping holes in her hull. This once beautiful, luxurious ship, now a wreck on the ocean floor. She takes with her all those on board, save one. Kentora Shimoda, the captain's personal steward, was the sole survivor of the sinking. It was the third time he was the sole survivor of a torpedoed ship. None of the others among the crew and none of the passengers survived. Also around this time in history are when the fossils of the Peking Man, which were last known to be in Singapore, disappear. What happened to them is unknown, but it is theorized that they went the same way as the fossils on the Mount Temple did because it is thought that a very probable explanation for the disappearance of the fossilized bones of this human ancestor is that they likely went down with the ship. A true blow to scientists studying human origins and extra salt in the wound of this tragedy. It is very likely they were completely obliterated in the initial explosions if they were indeed on board. Let it go by safely was the order given to the submarine captains if they saw the Awamaru, along with the description of her. What was Lachlan's reaction to this? This is the most stupid dispatch I have ever seen in my life. It's addressed to every submarine from Australia to north of Japan. How the hell are we supposed to know where the Awamaru is? It was later stated in official records after the sinking, she, the Awamaru, was carrying a cargo of rubber, lead, tin, and sugar. 1,700 merchant seamen and 80 first-class passengers, all survivors of ship sinkings, were being transported from Singapore to Japan. The survivor said no Red Cross supplies were on board, they having been previously unloaded. Queenfish never once saw the ship through the fog. Her crew merely saw her blip on radar blink out once she sank. When Kentaro Shimoda was picked up by the Queenfish, he told them who they had torpedoed, and she searched for more survivors, but found none. It had already been six hours after Kentaro had been rescued by then, and no one was left to save, if they would have even allowed themselves to be. Only Kentaro allowed himself to be plucked from the sea. More survivors had been at the scene earlier, but refused rescue attempts. Some even dove down into the oily water and drowned themselves. 
By the end of her second search over a day later, Kintera was still the only survivor. When news reached the mainland from her captain, Queen Fish was ordered back to port. All the submarine found at the scene of the sinking was 2,000 bales of barbed rubber floating in the sea, which were seized as evidence of the ship carrying contraband. Queen Fish's captain was relieved of command, was tried by court-martial, and convicted of negligence in obeying orders. He never again would command a submarine and received a letter of admonition from the Secretary of the Navy. Queen Fish went on to rescue 13 airmen 100 miles west of Iwo Jima a few weeks after the sinking of the Awa Maru. She would later sink an unnamed Japanese fishing vessel on July 4th, 1945. She would be stationed at Midway, preparing for another patrol when the war ended. She was sunk as a target in 1963. The U.S. government offered, through neutral Switzerland, to replace Awa Maru with a ship of similar proportions to her. A furious Japan demanded a full reimbursement of $45 million for the ship and $7.25 million for the goods and lives, bringing the total to a $52.5 million demanded payment. In spring of 1949, the Japanese government abandoned all compensation rights related to the sinking of the Awa Maru as a show of appreciation for the rebuilding efforts by the United States in Japan following the end of the war. 1977, the wreck of the Awa Maru was located 10 miles off the coast of China. Throughout 1979, 1980, and 1981, thousands of artifacts and human remains were returned to Japan by the Chinese salvage team, who were searching for a rumored cargo of billions worth of gold. No such cargo was ever actually on board the ship.